All right. Uh, hey, everybody. Uh, good evening, and uh, welcome to this session on Apache Arrow Flight SQL. Uh, my name is Lenoy Jacob, and I'm a solutions architect at Dremio. Uh, I apologize uh, for those who are expecting my esteemed colleague, Jason Hughes, to be up here. He, unfortunately, could not make it today. Uh, so I guess you guys are uh, stuck with me for the next 30 minutes. Um, all right, so uh, today I would like to go through uh, Arrow Flight SQL, what it is, and what do I mean by high performance, simplicity, and interoperability for data transfers. Our uh, agenda for today covers a few things. Um, we would uh, database server or vice versa. Uh, what options do we have in terms of data transfer, and uh, do we really need to change that? We'll then go over what Apache Arrow and Arrow Flight is, since they may be new to some folks here. And then we'll introduce um, what Arrow Flight SQL is and the benefits it brings over the traditional ODBC, JDBC world. And finally cover uh, what Arrow Flight SQL uh, ODBC, JDBC drivers are, uh, what that is, why they're important, and what's the value it brings. All right, uh, so what do I mean by data transfer? Um, in the context of this presentation, uh, I'm talking about transferring data between a server and a client, and in specific, between a database, data warehouse, data lake house, and a client. So um, what if we could have standardized APIs for all of the communication between databases and clients? Now, I know you guys might be thinking, hey, uh, we already have standardized APIs with things like ODBC and JDBC. But um, have you noticed that when you open clients like dBeaver or Tableau, uh, you see many different options in the data sources section? Why is that? Why couldn't it have been just one, right? So uh, it's true that ODBC, JDBC is standardized, but that's from a client perspective. Uh, but then you have so many different drivers for so many different databases uh, that are out there. Also, what if these transfers were highly performant? Um, that is, uh, you know, that is you get fast data transfers, whether you're transferring uh, 100 million records or whether you're transferring a billion records or, or, even, or even 100 records, right? And in the case of massively parallel processing systems, uh, distributed systems, um, what, you know, what can you do when you have more than one node in a cluster, right? What if multiple nodes could participate in that transfer? And finally, uh, whatever I'm going to propose should be easy to implement on the server side, and it should be easy for the clients to use. So let's take a look at some history. Um, why don't ODBC, JDBC fit in today's analytical world? Well, um, ODBC's first release was in 1992, and JDBC first released in 97. And really, in that world, uh, many of the clients and databases requirements were really row-based. It was uh, predominantly OLTP workloads, and there were some OLAP workloads, but uh, most of the time, the servers weren't returning a lot of the data to the client, right? Because the client wasn't doing a lot of logic on the stuff that it got. So it was mostly the databases that were doing most of the crunching and then returning a few rows or so to the client, and then it goes and displays that. Um, ODBC, JDBC, of course, was really beneficial. Um, it provided a lot of abilities, and one of the big things it did was it prevented this many-to-many -many kinds of uh, client-to-database APIs, you know, where every client has an API and every database has an API, which would have been a nightmare for interoperability, right? like that proliferation of so many different drivers uh, for both on the server side as well as the client side, right? But instead of that, uh, the ODBC, JDBC standardized the client side, and we ended up with this one many situation where you have one client API and many databases API. While this is much better, um, it wasn't great either, right? Uh, like I mentioned earlier, if you open dBeaver or Tableau, you can see that there could be like almost 90 plus different data sources, and each of them with its own drivers, right? And this is how it has been in the last you know, couple of decades, and we have kind of largely accepted that. But it could be better. So let's take a look at today, right? Um, and really today is that you have uh, two big pieces here, right? One, it is really a big data world, right? Uh, the amount of data that people are working with has grown gigantic. 
right? And uh, second, it's not just the database doing the computation anymore. Now we have clients that are doing some heavy computation, or at least some computation on big data. And what we learned a long time ago is that if you're dealing with large amounts of data, and if you're doing OLAP workloads, storing your data in a columnar format is generally going to give you a lot of benefits. So uh, databases generally started adopting that, right? Uh, and moreover, uh, as of late, clients generally started ad adopting that. However, uh, there isn't a standard to transfer columnar data as is from the database to the client. And what do we mean by transferring columnar data, right? So let's look at these two diagrams from the previous slide in detail, right? So generally, when a database transfers data, it needs to convert the data into ODBC, JDBC data buffers. So there's this conversion process involved when you want to use those standards, right? It's, it's, a, it's a serialization, deserialization deserial process that happens. Uh, now, this was totally okay in yesterday's world when both uh, ODBC, uh, when both the database and the client were row-oriented uh, and geared towards a uh, large number of columns and low number of rows. Uh, so if you're transferring a few kilobytes or maybe a few megabytes, you were good. Uh, but uh, that has not the case anymore, right? In today's world, both client and database are both columnar in nature. When transferring data, we are literally converting a columnar data to a row-based ODBC, JDBC data buffers, transferring them over the wire, and then converting them back to a columnar format, and this is like highly inefficient, right? So think about data science use cases, right, where we extract, I don't know, 100 million records or so, right, from a database server uh, to do, uh, and back to the client to do machine learning on the client side, right? And there's this overhead involved in serialization and deserialization, which adds to the transfer time. So, so think about it, right? Uh, data extraction is something that data scientists um, spend a lot, of time, a lot of time on, right? And what if we could improve on that? So uh, we talked about uh, ODBC, JDBC, and the issues uh, with that. Uh, one other method that I did not talk about is that we could, uh, you know, we could avoid this conversion process or this deserialization serialization process is uh, if the database server were able to build their own custom protocol. So you could, you know, like connect it uh, point to point directly uh, using the database's custom API. There's no conversion required. But then we run into the problem that we talked about a few slides ago, right, where both the client and the database have to maintain APIs, and then you lose the benefits of interoperability, and then you have that proliferation of all these different drivers, and you lose standardization, right? So it's kind of like a pick your poison situation, right? Uh, you choose, if you choose the ODBC, JDBC route, uh, you have this one many protocol situation, and while that's somewhat good, you are stuck with bad performance with the conversion of data from columnar to row and vice versa. Uh, but then if you choose a custom protocol path, you end up with this many to many protocol situation, which is good for performance, however bad for standardization, and you'll end up with hundreds of drivers to manage and maintain and all of that. So what if we can come up with a better solution, right? Uh, like if the data is already stored in a columnar format, uh, it is processed in the database as columnar, and the clients can also work with columnar data, then why can't we just transfer it over the network in a columnar format, right, and leverage all the benefits of columnar data? Like for instance, you know, like really being able to compress the data, you know, uh, before you transfer it over the wire, right? Like do things like run length encoding, you know, doing all sorts of different abilities to uh, maximize the amount of logical data transferred in, in the least amount of bytes as possible, right? Because more often than not, it's your network that's going to be a bottleneck, right? And the answer is yes. Uh, uh, and the really, the way that we can do this is with something known as Aeroflight. Uh, now, before we jump into Aeroflight uh, and the issues that it solves, uh, it's good to talk about what Apache Arrow is. Uh, this would be useful for those who are new to Arrow and or just getting into it. Um, so what is Apache Arrow? Uh, Arrow is a columnar in-memory data format. So if you've got columnar file formats like Parquet and ORC on disk, uh, then Arrow maintains that columnar execution in memory as well. Uh, but remember that while in-memory performance is great, uh, memory can be scarce. Uh, Arrow, uh, in fact, is designed to work even if the data doesn't fit entirely in memory. How does it do that? Uh, the core data structure of Arrow includes vectors of data and collections of these vectors, and it utilizes things like cache locality, pipelining features of modern processes, SIMD operations, and much more to be able to do data analysis uh, on vectorized data. It's also supported on many languages, including C++, Java, Python, Go, and so on. And uh, it's, uh, it's fully open source with a permissive license. Uh, it actually powers dozens of open source and commercial technologies out there. 
right? So that's a brief intro into Arrow. So the question becomes, um, isn't Arrow enough, right? Uh, well, Arrow is primarily geared towards operations on data, right? It does not have any specifications for cross-network transfer, right? Whether that's within a cluster, right, where if you're doing massively, you know, uh, MPP distributed computing systems, or if that's outside the cluster between a database and a server, right? And that's kind of where something known as Arrow Flight comes in. Um, so Arrow Flight provides that um, straight transfer, like you don't even have to convert it, right? Just transfer it in a columnar form, so it's Arrow on the source or something close to Arrow on the source, uh, which is in a columnar format, and then you transfer that over to the client, which is also going to speak Arrow or something very similar. Uh, this is particularly efficient if you know both the client and the application will just work with Arrow data directly, right? And then you can provide all these sorts of benefits that I talked about, right? You can improve uh, compression, you can improve your performance on the network transfer because the protocol is now serialization free, right, when transporting this, this arrow data. So, you know, at a very high level, think of it like you're drinking from the fire hose as opposed to drinking from the drinking straw, right? Uh, the cool thing is, uh, it also supports distributed computing from a client side of, uh, from a client side concept, right? So, you know, uh, uh, a data request to a database server uh, can return multiple endpoints to a client, and the client, if it was distributed in nature, could also retrieve data uh, uh, from each endpoint in parallel, right? Um, so similar to Arrow, Arrow Flight is also an open protocol uh, that the community can, community can support. It's built from the ground up for big data uh, in the modern world. It's made to be a better standard uh, um, than ODBC, JDBC. Um, let's look at a quick benchmark. Um, so in this graph, uh, you can see how the transfer speed differs between a standard ODBC versus flight on the same client and the same database, right? For 2,000 records, which is the first graph, uh, it's about uh, the same speed, I want to say. Uh, but once we get into larger amounts of data, you can really see the difference. Uh, if you look at the second graph, it takes about 60 seconds for 5 million records to be transferred via ODBC, and about 3 or 4 seconds in flight. Uh, if we bump that up to 1 billion records, which is uh, the uh, third graph, uh, we can see the real benefits, right? Flight re returns results in a significantly lower time than ODBC, right? Now keep in mind, this is a, on the same client, on the same database, so it's from a query performance standpoint, it's everything the same, right? Only, only thing that we're changing is the protocol that we're using to transfer data. So how does flight work? Uh, this is a typical uh, workflow for an Arrow flight program on a single machine that is not distributed. Uh, basically, you send a request to get information about a query, and then the server would send back uh, the schema for the query and a single endpoint, uh, and the client would then go to this endpoint and read the data from there. Uh, so as mentioned in this example, we have a single node. Where it uh, gets really interesting is if you have a distributed system and multiple nodes, which is my next slide. So uh, over here, you have a massively parallel processing distributed system. Uh, and over here, the database server can return multiple endpoints to the client, right? And now the client can go and fetch data from multiple endpoints in parallel, right? And aside uh, from that, the client, if it were also a distributed system with multiple nodes, like I mentioned earlier, uh, you can set it up in such a way that each client node can go and access each server node, the corresponding server node, uh, uh, whatever data is in there, right? And that would really uh, speed things up. So all that sounds great, right? Um, aren't we done now? Uh, well, the answer is not exactly. Um, if we take a look at why Arrow Flight isn't enough for all workloads, and specifically we are talking about uh, SQL workloads and OLAP workloads, is that the client generally sends an arbitrary byte stream, right? and the server interprets uh, this byte stream and then sends the results back to the client. But the key here is because that it's arbitrary, there is no standardization of the protocol, right? And because of that, uh, the particular server is, uh, is just going to accept, uh, expect that uh, byte stream to be in a certain format, right? And, uh, and if the client does not send it in that format, it's not going to know what to do with it. So there has to be that kind of coordination, right? Uh, but unfortunately, there's no standard yet. Right, and, uh, and we could end up with multiple competing standards if that were just allowed to pro proliferate, right? So uh, for instance, if you're using a technology like uh, Dremio, uh, if you send a single byte stream of uh, arrow flight buffers to Dremio, Dremio will interpret that as a UTF-8 encoded string uh, in SQL, and uh, it'll go ahead and execute that query. Uh, 
but uh, you don't necessarily know that as the client that if you were going to send that same byte stream to another database or whatever else database, then they might just end up interpreting it differently, right? And you might not get your results back or you may not get back what you were expecting. And really the key here is that uh, uh, Flight was uh, initially just designed to serve any tabular data, right? And that was the goal of Flight, right? It was not focusing on any particular databases as such, right? Um, like, for like for example, right, catalog information, like what tables do I have, right? It's a very simple one, right? And that's not really part of the arrow Flight design. Um, so if you take a step back, uh, you'll see that we have seen these problems before, right? I'm kind of, kind of alluding to the fact that in uh, computing, there are like very few 100% brand new problems, right? A lot of the times it's the same problem or 80 to 90% of the same problem, but it's like a new incarnation, right? It's like a uh, new implementation detail or, or whatever that is, right? So if you look at it, uh, ODBC and JDBC did solve this very similar problem and it did really standardize the query execution and the catalog aspect, uh, catalog access aspects as well, right? For each of the databases. So, you know, well, cool. Let's just take that solution whatever that worked there, and improve uh, on the places where it didn't work well, right? So that's really where Arrowflight SQL comes in, right? It's providing that standardization where it's not just an arbitrary byte stream. It's now um, uh, a standard where you start providing these things on top of uh, uh, Flight and to really enable these database access and enable all that workloads. Now coming back to this table here, you'll see that I've added uh, Arrowflight in here to uh, make it simpler. Uh, you can see that uh, Arrowflight completely supports uh, um, uh, standard, standardizing the client interface. It supports standardizing the server interface, and it prevents unnecessary uh, serialization. But what it does not do is it does not provide a standard client database access interface, right? And since Arrowflight was just built for the Tableau data, uh, it was not specifically built for uh, databases, and this is exactly uh, what Arrowflight where Arrowflight SQL comes in and what that aims to solve. So uh, let's go through what uh, Arrowflight SQL is, right? Uh, what it does is that it allows databases to use Arrowflight as the transportation prior protocol. Uh, you can um, leverage the performance of Arrow and Flight for uh, database access, uh, but you also, on top of that, really get the nice things that you wanted, like what are my tables, you know? Uh, you, you would want to standardize those messages so you can get these extended RPC calls, right? So, you know, uh, you know a few examples here, right? Um, you know, like from a query execution standpoint, right? This is what a query looks like, and this is the result set that's gonna get back, right? Uh, also, your prepared statement, right? So things like uh, here, here, you know, this is a query, but here are the placeholders for parameters. Don't go execute it yet, right? I'll send you a parameter list later, right? And so then you don't have to go through the whole planning process every single time I ask you to do that, right? Um, and uh, there's also command around database catalog metadata for retrieving table names, column names, data type, primary keys, et cetera, right? And, you know, as well as whatever other SQL syntaxes that you actually support, right? So every database is slightly different uh, as far as the SQL coverage goes. So some databases add uh, additional things on top of ANSI SQL, um, et cetera, right? And more largely, it is uh, kind of like uh, uh, a single set of client libraries, right, that can connect to any Flight SQL server, right? And so that's really big, right? Regardless of what the database is, as long as it exposes a Flight SQL endpoint and it follows these standards, you can connect it uh, using uh, these client libraries. So you no longer have that, you know, many-to-many -many or one-to-many. Um, you can actually have a one-to-one -one system that supports any database and any client. Just think about just one driver that supports any database and any client, columnar in nature altogether, right? So here's that how, how that would work, right? Uh, adding to the previous slides we, we saw on programmatically accessing uh, Arrow uh, Flight endpoints, um, you know, the, all the bold things uh, on this slide are Arrow Flight SQL, and the non-bold stuff are regular Arrow Flight, right? So we're not really replacing um, Arrow Flight here. We're just actually leveraging what a flight already has provided us, and we're just building on top of that, right? So it starts with something like, you know, hey, give me a list of the tables, right? So that's a get table command, right? And basically, these are just basically standards, right? And so, you know, hey, when I say this, I mean this, right? And so the database exactly know what it's getting, what it's supposed to send back, and, and all, all of that, right? So it gets a list of table, it returns the list back, and then from querying the table, you just send this command in, right? Uh, and this is exactly the SQL query, and this is what I expect, right? 
Um, so uh, these get standardized, but it's still, remember, it's still leveraging arrow flight under the covers, and you get all of those benefits of that columnar compression out there. So uh, this, is, uh, this slide just goes through uh, all of the calls that can be made with Arrow Flight SQL. Uh, so you have all of the catalog stuff uh, um, you know, that gets the metadata, you know, things like get tables, get table, you know, uh, table types, column types, primary keys, uh, SQL stuff, right? Uh, and then also there's a SQL query uh, commands to basically send and retrieve uh, uh, queries and result sets. And also supports for things like uh, prepared statements. And so, uh, coming back to this uh, table here, uh, I've added uh, Flight SQL, uh, Arrow Flight SQL in here, and you can see that it covers everything, right? It standardizes the client interface, it standardizes the server interface, it pre prevents unnecessary serialization, and it also provides a standardized client, client database access interface, right? So, um, you, know, um, you know, all around, uh, all around um, thing, right? To, to just enable data transfer easily. So, now, the obvious question is, isn't that enough, and do we really need more? And the short answer is, it would be nice if we were done, right? Uh, but the reality is that, uh, you know, Arrow Flight SQL is fairly new, and it's going to take time for it to be widely adopted by existing client, especially if you look at uh, the enterprise BI tools, right, where um, development pace is generally slower, and the release cadence is slower, as well as uh, the desire to output brand new things is also generally slower, right? So um, the nice thing is uh, most of these tools already support the traditional ODBC, JDBC uh, syntax, right? Uh, so it's like, hey, can we give them something uh, uh, to make them work in the meantime while they are working on adopting it natively? Right, and that's really where this next thing called the uh, Arrow Flight SQL ODBC JDBC drivers come in. So let's just quickly look at these drivers, right? Um, so they are uh, ODBC and uh, JDBC drivers to the client, but they are built on top of uh, uh, Flight SQL libraries, right? Uh, because uh, Flight SQL libraries can connect to any endpoint that exposes uh, a, a Flight SQL server. Right, uh, it it can it can be just as intuitive as that. Right, the single driver can connect to any of those. Right, and so if you have a JDBC tool that you want to connect to a database that exposes a Flight SQL endpoint, you can just use a single driver, and you do not have to make any code changes. Right, so you can just pop this thing in Tableau or Power BI or whatever your tool of choice is, and as long as that database exposes a Flight SQL endpoint, there's only one driver that that you're going to need. Right, which is pretty powerful. Right. And uh, the other key thing is that it's completely open source, right? We will be fully open sourcing these very soon, and the community can take full advantage of that and adopt them and contribute uh, back as well as provide feedback and all of that, right? So um, let's take a quick comparison, right? Uh, let's look at the uh, traditional ODBC, JDBC uh, versus uh, Arrow Flight SQL. Uh, based ODBC JDBC drivers, right? And we look at it across two different, uh, two main axes of differences, right? Uh, first is driver management, and the second is performance. Um, so, uh, with driver management, uh, if you look at uh, a traditional ODBC JDBC's current uh, state, you need to install and manage a driver for every single database, right? Um, every different database you're connecting to, you need to install and manage a driver for that, right? Uh, versus uh, Arrow Flight SQL, you still need to do that installation and you still need to manage it. However, you just have to do that once for a single driver, regardless of how many databases you're connecting to, right? Or even if you're connecting to a brand new database that doesn't exist today, right? As long as they all support uh, Arrow Flight SQL and exposes an, uh, exposes an Arrow Flight endpoint, right? So uh, that's nice from one perspective, but if you really look into performance, uh, the traditional ODBC, JDBC uh, does row-based transfers. So uh, they're okay for small amounts of data, but they are really not great for large amounts of data, right? Versus Arrow flight-based drivers, uh, which are column-based transfers, so you get the benefit that we talked about, right? The compression of the data over the wire, right? It allows you to transfer more logical data with uh, fewer amount of bytes, right? So you get data more, you get data transferred more effectively. So um, all that sounds great. Um, it sounds like I should use ODBC, JDBC drivers for Arrow Flight SQL for everything, right? Well, the answer to that is uh, no, not everything, right? Uh, so when, when wouldn't I, right? And the key thing is here is that it's generally preferable if you have native uh, Flight SQL applications, 
right? And, uh, and that's really because it's easy to harness uh, feature features like multiple endpoints and things like that, right? And the key here is uh, you also get a lot of performance if uh, your client is also column-based as well, right? Um, so if you uh, look at this diagram over here, right, your database, which is column-based on the right, and your client is row-based on the left, uh, you're going to need to convert it into a row-based format at some point, right? Uh, you, can, you, can, you, know, you can still leverage the column or benefits when you actually transfer to the wire, but uh, then just convert it back when you get it at the client, right? Uh, and you can use the existing ODBC, JDBC drivers for this, and that works, and that does make a lot of sense. But uh, if your client is also column-based, so you have column on the right with the database, column on the left with the database, uh, and then it goes over the wire in a column-based arrow format, which is great, but then you have to convert it to row just because you are transferring via ODPC, JDBC, and then convert it back again to columnar, uh, just because your client is columnar, and that part is really unnecessary, right? And that is where you would leverage something like arrow flight ODPC, JDBC drivers, right? Um, so uh, if you look at the stack, um, um, you can uh, use the SQL native client, uh, which, which uh, uses the Arrow Flight SQL standard that goes directly to Arrow Flight uh, endpoints, right? You can have your legacy client as well. Uh, that basically, that's your row-based uh, clients that can sit on top of uh, JDBC, and then that leverages Arrow Flight SQL. All right, um, coming back to this slide again. Uh, so let's look at uh, all that, what we were able to solve for our data transfer situation, right? So essentially what we have done is we have standardized APIs across, right? Uh, it is high performance because we don't do unnecessary serialization. It allows for parallel data transfer. It establishes uh, a one-to-one -one situation from a driver standpoint, right? Uh, you can have a distributed client system. You can have a distributed uh, server system. Both can be columnar in nature. Right, and, and ultimately uh, it's easy to implement both from the server side as well as the uh, client side. All right, and with that we have come to the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you folks for listening. Uh, at this time we'll open it up to questions. Uh, you can also reach out to Jason or I via email uh, for any questions, thoughts, uh, or feedback as well. Uh, we've got about uh, five, seven minutes remaining. So, questions. <laughs> Yeah, so the driver that we're implementing does take that into uh, account, right? I think there are, at, at, uh, off, the, off the bat, there will be two modes of authentication. One is your traditional username password, and then there'll be a, a personal access token based, uh, based access. These are the two that we're starting with, and then we'll add on as, as the event time goes by. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, so uh, uh, we are still yet to release this, but we have done demos on uh, Tableau and Power BI, and they work pretty well. So largely we have seen uh, right off the bat by using the full-fledged ODBC, JDBC drivers, along with Arrowflight SQL and Arrowflight and Arrow all put together, uh, we have seen about 30% performance improvements over standard ODBC, JDBC. Yes, Arrowflight driver. It is, it is the native integration. Right, yeah. So the cool thing about this is, um, it is uh, basically client or server agnostic, so if you want to use Spark with this, you can absolutely go ahead, right? The idea with this is we are, um, well, if you're using Spark, you would use the, the Python PySpark libraries directly, right? You, would, you wouldn't use uh, something like the JDBC driver, right? If, the idea here is if you have a system that's built out already, like for example, Tableau, right? Uh, you would then just plug this driver in, right, without having to talk to Tableau and get the driver, you know, installed and initiated and all of that stuff, right? So, any other questions? Yes. Um, it's the end-to-end. -end. It's the end from executing the query, transfer, all of that stuff, yeah. 
Yes. Yeah, ideally, I'm expecting, I would envision it to be much better performance because now you're just eliminating the JDBC overhead, right? If Tableau natively starts supporting Aeroflight, right, then you don't need the JDBC overhead, right? So this is just an interim thing that we are releasing so that, you know, yeah. Yeah, so, um, yeah, because um, it is still worth doing it because you really don't have to make any code changes at all, right? Uh, because if you need arrow flight performance right off the bat and your clients are using JDBC, you're kind of stuck over there, right? So that's why you would want to use this, right? Uh, or the next thing is, next best thing is to wait until, um, uh, you know, the BI tools, you know, get, get support for this. Yeah, so the example of Spark uh, doesn't really apply here because you have native Arrow flight libraries for Spark already, right? So you don't really need to go via JDBC to, to do that, right? You can just use it natively directly. If you're using PySpark, you can use it by, by Arrow library and, you know, you're, you're done, right? Uh, this is for situations where, you know, it takes time for clients to adopt that Arrow flight standard, right? So, so let's say the uh, better question would be if Power BI or Tableau, uh, you have a Tableau set up right now and you know, Tableau or Power BI has yet to adopt Aeroflight SQL, and I'll give you an example here. Uh, that is where you would just plug in this driver into the JDBC section, right, and then use, and you would still get benefits of uh, a columnar uh, transfer of, of Arrow, Arrow buffers, yeah. Thank you guys, uh, have a good evening.